everyone. My name is Emily Kid White, and I'm an assistant professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, where I teach legal philosophy and public and constitutional law. I was deeply honored when Sonia, Jamie, and Patrick asked if I might chair the session on Peter's textbooks. I'm very proud to be a relatively new faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School. I was hired under Lauren's tenure as Dean. And I often think of the great Peter Hogg when I stand before my constitutional law students in the well of my lecture hall. And for my first few years of teaching, where the ratio stands roughly at about 20 hours of studying and lecture prep to every hour in front of the classroom, I always made it my practice to complete my preparations with the slow and quiet reading of Peter's textbook entry on the day's subject matter. I still do this, and it is always when I finish those pages or refinish those pages, reading them right down to the footnotes, that I know I'm ready to begin. In this final panel on this remarkable day, it is my great privilege to sit alongside such excellent others. Full biographies are available on the conference website, but I know that this crowd will simply need no introductions to my co-panelists. We have here today Adam Dodick of the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, Scott Wilkie of Blake's, my dear and much cherished colleagues at Osgoode Hall Law School, Bruce Ryder and Jin Yen Lee, and Wade Wright of Western Law. Our final plenary will speak to Peter's textbooks via a series of questions. I will begin with Wade Wright, who notably in 2020, with the rich blessings of Peter's family, took authorship of Peter's Constitutional Law of Canada, the leading treatise on constitutional law in Canada, which was released in its first edition, as we all heard today, countless times in 1977. Wade, could you kindly lead us off today by telling us a little bit about the history of the text? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, before we, before I do that, though, I just did want to say uh, a couple of words about uh, about my dear friend and and mentor Peter. So, in the days and weeks after Peter's death in 2020, I often heard two words uh, that were uttered in describing him: legal giant. Uh, and I think, as we can uh, see from the, the conference today, that Peter was indeed a legal giant, a brilliant legal scholar, educator, and lawyer. But Peter was also a giant for me on a more personal level. Uh, when I graduated law school in 2003, uh, a young gay man from a small farming community in southwestern Ontario, first generation in my family to go to university, the idea of becoming a legal academic didn't really seem within my reach or something that I even really thought about. And it was Peter, in fact, that encouraged me uh, to think about a career in legal academia. And then when I made that decision to pursue uh, that path, it was Peter that encouraged me uh, along the way. And so it's sometimes it's trite to say things like this, but in Peter's case, it's actually true uh, that I really don't think I would actually be a legal ac academic today, but for him. So as far as the history of the treatise, we've actually heard uh, a fair amount about this uh, already today. So my apologies to the extent uh, that you've heard this already. Uh, when I assumed authorship of the treatise in 2020, in those uh, heady, tumultuous early days of the, the pandemic, one of the first things that I did um, was that I actually purchased the earlier editions. Uh, of the treatise, because I was actually interested in understanding its development over time, so that I could help to, and I could understand why uh, were these particular choices made to place things in, in, in these places. Uh, and the thing that struck me as I delved into those earlier editions uh, were really how they can actually tell us a broader story about the development of the Constitution of Canada over the last 45 years uh, or so. So the first edition, as we've heard several times, was published in 1977. We've heard the kind of perhaps unlikely story of how Peter came uh, to develop the, the treatise, asked to teach constitutional law, perhaps an unlikely person to do that uh, as a New Zealander, not educated, 
in Canadian constitutional law, decided that he would take up uh, the challenge, created these course notes that then became the foundation of the first edition of the book. So the book was actually fairly substantial in size, 548 pages, but in fact, it pales in comparison to the size of the treatise now. The treatise is now close to, I think, 2,800 pages uh, in, uh, in length. So uh, in that first edition, it had only three parts. The first part uh, dealt with basic concepts. The second part dealt with the division of powers. And then the third part, uh, which I find quite interesting, really only two chapters dealing with civil liberties and the Canadian Bill of Rights. So this edition tells us really a larger story about the development of the Constitution of Canada, because of course, being published in 1977 before the amendment battles of the 1980s and the enactment of the Constitution Act of 1982, we don't have chapters dealing with constitutional amendment we don't have chapters dealing with the charter, uh, and we also don't have chapters dealing with Section 35, Aboriginal Treaty Rights, or certainly Indigenous law. So the second uh, edition of the treaties was published in 1985, only three years after the Constitution Act of 1982 was passed. So that edition ballooned in size, it doubled uh, to almost a thousand pages, and it does in fact deal with the issues that were thrown up by the constitutional negotiations of the 1980s uh, and the Constitution Act of 1982. The most striking change, of course, is that in part three, we now get the addition of seven new chapters dealing with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So when the Supreme Court, uh, or when this edition was published in 1985, the Supreme Court had only released three decisions. Uh, interpreting the new charter. And so I think the second edition makes for very interesting reading, because if you look at those chapters, what they often are are Peter's unvarnished views uh, about how these provisions of the charter should be interpreted. We then go to the third edition, published in 1992. That edition of the book grew again in size, now up to 1,500 pages. Uh, and that was the first edition to be published in loose leaf format. Uh, from there on in, Peter updated the book on a yearly basis. So as Peter noted, when the first edition of the book was published in 1977, the Supreme Court was generally only releasing about three or four constitutional decisions a year. By 1992, it was releasing around 40 constitutional decisions uh, a year. So the task of updating the book became very significant. Um, so the book is now, of course, in its fifth edition, the fifth edition was published in 2007. It was in, uh, in its earliest iteration, 2000 pages, as I say, it's now up to 2100. Um, I'm responsible for some of that growth uh, in, in size. Um, so Peter updated the book uh, yearly until his death uh, in 2020. So as Emily mentioned, I assumed uh, authorship of the book in 2020. And my first update was released in 2021. Since then, I have done two more yearly updates and I'm currently working on my fourth. I had a huge amount of respect for Peter before I took on the task of authoring this book. And I have an even huger level of respect for him now. I think each one of the updates takes years off of my life. Um, so I have updated the book to reflect recent developments, of course but also substantially revised certain parts uh, of the book as well, including the chapter dealing with the hog power and the chapters dealing with section nine and 15 of the charter. Uh, I also have various plans to update other parts of the book and a, a project that I'm currently undertaking that I'm particularly uh, excited about uh, is working with a really fantastic team of scholars of indigenous and Aboriginal law to add a chapter to the book about indigenous constitutionalism uh, and also to reimagine the chapter in the book dealing with Aboriginal peoples, uh, which will be renamed. So Peter's shoes are huge ones to fill, um, but my hope is that I'll be able to ensure that the book continues to be a resource that's useful uh, to all of us going forward. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, Wade. What a memorable spot start. Uh, Scott, could I ask you now to introduce us, uh, or those of us in the room less knowledgeable about this text, to the Treaties on Taxation? Thank you. 
Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege to be here and I'd just like Wade, if you could indulge me just for a, a minute or so, I have a, a couple of things like too that uh, has much more to do with the textbooks and uh, Peter's influence uh, than you might imagine. Um, the last quarter of my 40 years or so of uh, professional life was spent at Blake's as a partner. Um, I knew Peter uh, vicariously through his writing for the first 30. Uh, and uh, I think if I recall correctly, at his initiative, I came to know him personally as a, as a friend, as a lunch companion, um, uh, as a professional colleague, including in advice giving uh, and as a co-author in the last 10. Uh, and I think as either Justice Martin or Justice Karakatsanis, or maybe both of them remarked uh, during the Supreme Court uh, a panel, um, my first reaction when he got in touch with me as a, as a uh, arriving at Blake's was, how am I worthy of this? Um, but we used to lunch regularly uh, reasonably regularly and invariably we would go to the great hall at Osgoode Hall and uh, we we never had an agenda we would just start talking as we walked up Bay Street and it would continue for two hours or so invariably I would reach the table earlier than Peter even though we arrived at the door at the same time and invariably when we left uh, I was waiting for him at the exit as he made his way and the reason for that was much like a royal visit uh, as he proceeded to the table and proceeded away from the table, uh, the throngs would, would rise. Uh, admirers, friends, former students, uh, uh, to, to greet him, to remember him, to be remembered uh, by him. And um, I, I, I think that that's uh, a mark not only of all of the characteristics I've been listening to about him from a personal point of view, but also the depth and scope of his influence uh, on minds for a very long time, which is of course reflected in how the, the law develops. And uh, now if I can, I've got a few slides, more, 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 more as a discipline for me than, than anybody else. So you know, forgive me for them um, because this really isn't an occasion for that. But the, the, the tax textbook and the tax people here are very much um, uh, 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 bookended by a great deal of constitutional scholarship uh, today. The tax textbook arose as the uh, compendium of Peter's teaching notes. Um, as uh, Professor Lawrence remembered this morning uh, in the session that I was at, he arrived in Canada as a new Canadian uh, at an institution that was a new or reinvented academic institution uh, and without any Canadian legal background in, in 1970. Uh, and as I understand it, uh, then Dean Ledane um, uh, invited him to teach a couple of courses, which were intensely Canadian courses, uh, tax law, statute law, and constitutional law, of course, is the framework for a particular country's way of going about things. And uh, imagine, if you will, uh, being handed uh, those those tasks as a, a new Canadian uh, scholar and proceeding to deal with them. And the way he dealt with them, and this is as, as much anecdotal for him to me as uh, as uh, others may know it in other ways, is, is that he worked very hard uh, to teach himself first and to teach his students shortly after uh, as his interlocutors. And I think that that says as much as uh, as as anything uh, about his uh, his pedagogy his perception of the role of teacher in the narrow sense and in the large sense uh, and, and his um, recognition that the the law particularly the tax law is highly or organic highly uh, dynamic uh, and highly contextual that is it's it has um, a systemic context that's not only the the private law context, which good tax practitioners and good tax teachers have to be equally expert in, uh, but it has um, a significant uh, public law uh, dimension. And both the tax law and the constitutional law, of course, are public law. Uh, and um, I think, uh, and I think Peter must have thought, although I never offered this observation to him, uh, that while the constitutional law offers the framework uh, and uh, means for executing uh, 
fiscal choices. Fiscal choices appreciated in the largest sense as those choices that a country makes about its large civility and then how to go about it from a social welfare and an economic and, uh, and, and, and other ways. The tax law is the way it gets paid for. The tax law enables the fiscal choices for which the Constitution law is a framework. And I think that one of the um, significant features of the tax text, uh, which is something that is latent and that leaps out at you after a while, after using it and after thinking about it, um, uh, is something that was observed also in the Supreme Court panel is when you look at the table of contents for that text and you look at how the chapters are organized from a bottom up as opposed to a top down way of looking at the law, how uh, the constitutional focus, like I can put it that way on pith and substance, uh, is reflected in the accessibility that Peter contributed to uh, articulating and understanding the law, the, the effort that he made to understand the law, the tax law in its larger context in order to be able to convey the reason why provisions were in the tax law, what they meant, what they didn't mean, and, and how they should be seen to, to operate together. Uh, I, 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 I think that the, the, uh, the, the uh, proximity of the tax law uh, which many who are not tax specialists regarded, I think, it, it, certainly in the academy, as kind of a second order of thing, a little bit less important than the other legal disciplines, and I say that respectfully, I think it's true, uh, is, is essentially a, a significant component of the constitutional law, but, but, but one that's not commonly uh, seen that way. And I, I saw that with Peter, not only in an academic context, but as a professional colleague at Blake's, we did have uh, occasion to engage in advice giving in circumstances where the constitutional law and the income tax law intersected in ways that actually mattered uh, to uh, to private clients, uh, and uh, it was a very interesting um, uh, and I think mutually productive engagement when that when that when that happened. Uh, I mean, this is uh, another this this slide effectively reflects that realization. This is from something that we wrote together, and and. Um, I think that the uh, whether it's reflected in the last panel that I heard uh, concerning uh, uh, chaired by Professor Cameron uh, concerning among other things his First Nations advice uh, or in other contexts that have been spoken about today, his sense was one of system. Maybe it was because he was a new Canadian in 1970 and he was coming at. Uh, the Canadian law, the Canadian public law, uh, without any preconceptions. Uh, but, uh, uh, but um, I think it's. Um, uh, I, I, I think that that that's reflected in the in the in the in the tax text. Um, the other another thing about the tax text, uh, again, in its rigor, uh, and, and as a reflection of Peter's uh, rigorous thought, is that while he. He understood that the tax law was an enabler uh, of fiscal choices. He also understood and insisted, I think, on um, both as a pedagogical matter and professionally, um, that the law is the law, that well, it, it might be an instrument for achieving um, various social outcomes, uh, but the lawyer's role was with respect to the law and not with respect to the social outcomes. There was a OBA interview that he gave in 2016, I think, in which he reflected on this point and expressed some reservations uh, about judicial review with respect to the charter because he said that it was putting lawyers in a position they were not experts to be in a position to be. And I, I think he worried about that. Uh, if I can just sum up in, in, in 30, 30 seconds with respect to what we can learn from Peter via the text, even though he's not teaching us uh, uh, directly anything but tax in the in the text. I, I think it's that the, the law matters um, as the law and one can't be the expert one needs to be um, without first becoming an expert in the law, no matter how one wishes to use it to enable other uh, objectives. Um, uh, secondly, that it is principle, it is coherent, uh, in, particularly for non-tax people thinking about tax law. I, I think there's probably a pre predisposition to think that it is neither of those things, but it, it is systemic, it is coherent, it's internally consistent, but only if you think about it as part of a system of law, which is how Peter perceived it uh, evidently in his, his text, and, and it's organic. 
that is the text is in its 10th edition right now i think professor lee will talk a little bit about it i was his successor when he ceased to be the record author, author a record author on the cover for a couple of those editions uh the, the, much like the constitutional text i suppose it not only grew but it evolved uh, because uh, the mind behind it continued to educate itself with respect to the law that it spoke to uh, and um, reflecting his intellectual honesty and his curiosity, um, it got better and better and better. And with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, telling us about the taxation law treaties. Uh, I'd like to invite Bruce up for a moment, and I'm wondering if he could help us think about the impact of the constitutional law of Canada treaties on federalism jurisprudence for a little while. Thank you. Uh, sure, I can do that. It's a good thing that Emily asked me to do that before today. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that here we are after 4 p.m. and I think there are still many ways that we can <laughs> hopefully talk about how wonderful Peter is. And it's, it's, um, it's been difficult to narrow it down, but I decided that I would focus on Peter's contributions to the federalism jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada. So my paper is called Peter Hogg. The Supreme Court of Canada and Cooperative Federalism. And when I embarked on, on looking into that topic and reviewing Peter's contributions, I was like Wade uh, when he was taking on his responsibility, drawn back to the beginning. And maybe for me, that was in part an act of nostalgia because when I was in law school uh, studying constitutional law in the early 1980s, I benefited hugely from being able to draw on constitutional law of Canada. And when I was a graduate student uh, and when I was clerking at the Supreme Court of Canada in the mid 80s, again, uh, Peter's book was just an in incredible, uh, incredibly valuable resource. And it still blows my mind, really what Peter accomplished in that first edition. So I would like to focus on that first edition and talk about the approach that Peter took to federalism um, and also just honor the incredible accomplishment that that book was. And we've all been reminded today that Peter first taught constitutional law in the fall of 1971. And he taught the course five times. Um, I think the last one before the book was published was the spring of 1976. And over the course of those five years, he, he was using the Laskin casebook and his own supplements and his own supplements increasingly included his own notes that became chapters of the book. But by 1976, there were, and he included those notes in his supplements, and they're in the basement of the Osgoode Hall Law Library. And there were about five chapters completed in the spring of 1976. No doubt he had extensive lecture notes as well, but he was on sabbatical in 1976-77. He installed himself at um, uh, the University of Toronto Law School and he wrote another 25 chapters, or 20, because so, the book had 25 over the course of his sabbatical, and the book was published in the fall of 1977. And I just think it's an, an incredible accomplishment. And um, the book was immediately well received by political scientists and, and uh, legal scholars alike. They all raved about it as a essentially an instant classic that would be an enduring resource for many years to come. And of course, they were right. Um, and then what happened, of course, was, and, and Peter hoped for this, but didn't anticipate it, that the book would be so influential in uh, the development of constitutional jurisprudence by the Supreme Court of Canada and, and other courts. And that's what I'd like to use my few remaining minutes to say a few words about. Um, and the reason why I've titled my paper, Peter, the Supreme Court of Canada and Cooperative Federalism, because I think if we return, especially to the 1977 first edition and look at all of the elements of Peter's approach to the interpretation of the division of legislative powers in the Constitution Act 1867, we will see that everything he advocated I mean, not literally everything, well, some few minor exceptions, but all the major arguments that he made regarding the pith and substance doctrine, the double aspect doctrine, 
the Interjurisdictional Immunity Doctrine, the Paramancy Doctrine, the National Dimensions Branch of the POG power, the General Trade and Commerce power, and I could go on, but those are some of the obvious examples, have become part of the Supreme Court's approach. And I think we take for granted that all those various elements of the Supreme Court of Canada's cooperative approach or, or con conception of cooperative federalism, we take it for granted now because it's so deeply embedded in the jurisprudence. But we shouldn't forget that in 1977, there was a large gap between Peter's views and the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada. And the content of the 1977 first edition was transformative and it was also brilliant, as many people have commented, in terms of its style, the clarity, um, how succinct it was. And that, too, was reflected in the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence in the decades to follow. So it's not surprising, for example, that the judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, who was the greatest stylist in the 1980s, was also the biggest fan of Peter Hogg. And Justice... Chief Justice Dixon, and before he was Chief Justice, freak, more than anyone else, embraced Peter's approach to both writing and to the content of um, the jurisprudence. Um, so I, I think it's really important to, to reflect on that transformative impact that Peter had. And in my paper, I've endeavored to go through um, some of the details that may be familiar to to many already in this audience, but it really is quite striking. So at this point, we can say, uh, when it comes to the jurisprudence on the division of powers, there is a near total convergence between Peter's approach and the approach of the Supreme Court of Canada. And I don't think we can say that about any other area of the law in Canada the convergence between the scholars' contributions and the development of the jurisprudence. And I think that's remarkable. It's maybe a little bit of an overstatement, but it is a, a, a remarkable um, convergence. And that doesn't mean, of course, that Peter's principled structure, uh, his architecture of the, of the doctrine of Canadian, the doctrines of Canadian federalism is necessarily going to be determinative in particular cases. But it is his structure that we argue within. Uh, take, for example, the recent decision of the Supreme Court of Canada and the Impact Assessment Act reference. So it's court split 5-2. The majority cited Peter half a dozen times. The dissent cited Peter. They did better. They cited him over a dozen times. And I think if Peter were here, he would probably say that he agreed with the dissenters because their approach is more consistent with the weight that he put on the importance of, uh, as much as possible, interpreting legislation to conform to the Constitution. He was always a huge proponent of judicial restraint, particularly in the context of the division of powers. Um, do I have another minute? One minute. Um, and that, this brings me to, this is the last thing I'll say, one of the most important aspects of especially the first edition of the Constitutional Law of Canada is, and I don't think we always recognize this, is it had an important normative perspective or an important theoretical perspective. And Peter was modest about articulating what it was. And he's perhaps most often celebrated as a great clarifier for his incredible descriptive and synthesizing powers. But he was also, especially when you look at the 1977 edition, a great theoretical thinker. And um, there's a beautiful interview with him, by the way, um, that was done by the Osgood Society for Canadian Legal History uh, in 1991, where he talks about this, that it was always important to him to both describe what the law is, but take a critical approach as well. And his critical approach was grounded in an appreciation of the federal principle principle, the division of legislative powers between the different levels of government that are equal and autonomous within their spheres, and the democratic principle, which led him to place great weight on the legislation enacted by our democratically elected representatives. And his thinking is all formed by 
his attempt to balance those two principles are given uh, respect in the decision making of the court. I'll, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. He was glad that I gave him uh, the question beforehand, but actually I hang around his office door all the time asking overwhelmingly large questions at inopportune times. So <laughs> he always rises to the occasion. So next I'd like to ask if I may, uh, Adam and Jinyan, if you could tell us a story about how Peter's textbook once helped you during your career. Adam, could we start with you? Sure, thanks very much. First of all, it's an incredible uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, Osgood holds a really special place uh, in my heart. Uh, I began my career teaching at Osgood, thanks to Justice then Dean Patrick Monaghan. And um, Osgood really taught me how to be a teacher. I had the incredible privilege to work with Trevor Farrow, Robert Way, Janet Mosher on helping to develop, create, and then uh, deliver the Ethical Lawyering in a Global Community course. And I still, to this day, count many friends amongst uh, the faculty. Uh, so as you just heard, I never took a course with Peter. I was never a colleague of Peter's. I never worked with Peter. But I consider him one of the Why most- Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear in a moment. <laughs> One of the most influential figures uh, in my professional career. And, you know, we often talk about people who can sort of make or break your career. Peter was one of these people who could help make your career. I don't know if there's anyone who ever broke their career. Hopefully not. But I think there are many people in this room that might have, that have already sort of shared stories about how Peter helped sort of make their career. And, and here's how Peter and his Constitutional Law of Canada helped sort of create and start my career. The, the first article that I ever wrote and published in Canada was in the early 2000 on the role of the Governor General. And uh, it was really hard to get published. Uh, it got rejected by uh, a number of law journals. Um, some of the, I remember the, the briefest rejection uh, note that I have ever received in my life, and I have a share of them, was this is not law, period, <laughs> rejection. Really, like, th this is not law. This is the realm of political science. It is not law. And finally, uh, there was a journal the, uh, the, that decided uh, to publish that. Uh, the UNB Law Journal, which worked out well for me because it was published, it turned out to be peer-reviewed, and I was just so incredibly excited. And a few years later, Patrick Monaghan told me that at that time, in a sort of pre-Osgood Digital Library, pre-sort of early internet days, the st studies showed that the average law journal was read by 3.1 people. Right? And Patrick told me two of those were the external peer reviewers. <laughs> the third was probably your mother. <laughs> so, you know, statistically, like nobody else read most law review articles. So I needed to, you know, how to sort of distribute it. So I, I'm sitting, I'm a first year associate. I'm so excited that this article was published. So I take it and I photocopy it. And I send it to probably about 30 constitutional lawyers and constitutional law professors around the country and say, hope, you know, think maybe you'll be interested in this, would love to get your response, et cetera. I don't get a single response back, except from Peter Hall. I'm 29 years old. I'm sitting as a first year associate office, you know, a couple blocks downtown from this and the phone rings. And this is 100% true. This is not embellished at all. And the other is Peter Hogg. Hi, Adam. This is Peter Hogg. Thank you so much for sending me a copy of your article on the Governor General. I'm really interested in it. And I would like to cite it in the next edition, next update of Constitutional Law of Canada. 
Meanwhile, like I'm just falling off my seat. Like what, <laughs> what could be better? But then he says, there's only one problem. You only sent me the odd numbered pages. <laughs> Would you be so kind as to send me the even numbered pages? And at first I was sort of mortified. I was excited, all of these different emotions. And, you know, I, I realized that, well, the other 29, 30 people, well, maybe they had never even flipped the page over to page two. They just threw it in the recycling bin. But Peter was at least interested in the subject, A, that he thought it was worthy of being cited, and B, that he would ask in only his sort of gener generous way, that only Peter could tell you you were an idiot and make you feel great about it, right? So he did cite that. And, and for me at 29, trying to figure out do I want to be a lawyer who does some academic writing or do I want to be an academic? That injected me with such incredible sort of confidence that this was something worth pursuing and developed a, a lifelong relationship with Peter where we would get together. We would talk about ideas of the law. He, you know, it turned out that he cited, a, he cited that article just to disagree with the position <laughs> that I had set out. But of course, you know, I didn't care. Like, what is it, you know, whether you're cited by the Supreme Court or by Peter Hogg, like, if they're telling you you disagree with your position, but at least they quote, they cite you, that, you know, that's great. So Peter became one of my, certainly one of my most important academic mentors, sponsors. He wrote letters. He thought enough of my scholarship that he was willing to write, you know, letters of recommendation for academic jobs. And that really relates to that first article, uh, that he was interested enough to want to see the even numbered pages as well. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Too. <laughs> so I can't really follow up on that. <laughs> But um, uh, can I start, Emily? Okay. Uh, well, firstly, let me congratulate the organizing committee. This is such a wonderful event. So I'm really privileged to be included in the, in the panel. Um, I uh, was appointed uh, to Osgood in 1999, along with Lauren, uh, when Peter was the dean of the school. And so I, my career was connected with Peter and my career at Oscar. And um, I was uh, uh, thrilled when he invited me to join him in writing the new edition of the book. So this, this is the book without my name. Uh, this is the book that with my name. Um, you cannot imagine what adding my name to the cover meant to me. Uh, like Wade, I, I grew up in a people's commune in China. <clears throat> I uh, came to Canada in 1985. I was struggling as a legal academic, trying to publish in English about Canadian tax law. <laughs> and it was such a struggle. So when I got the invitation, I got the trust of the great Peter to be a co-author of the book. It was such a validation of my potential. <laughs> I don't know how much he actually knew I could write it, but the trust he played in me in working on this book and the kind of freedom he gave me, he didn't stipulate anything. It is a join me, be an author. And I had tremendous freedom in writing anything I want to write about. So it's really not like uh, updating the book. I was a legitimate co-author of the book and I used my freedom liberally and he never complained. The only time I got a call from him was, you have to make it simpler. <laughs> so, so this book and Peter had um, played a tremendous role in my career. The topic Emily gave us is, what does the book do to you, to your career? So, um, and so in terms of my career as a writer, I became better because I need to write more clearly. I need to be clarifying things and I need to get to first principles. 
And that was difficult for a tax lawyer to do because the Income Tax Act has over a million words and it weighs uh, six pounds in, in, in print. So it's a tremendous challenge, but I learned bit by bit to write as clearly as possible. So I became a better writer. I also became a better teacher because I had to teach students the framework, the first principles, fundamental concepts, and make sense what the rules in the gigantic statute were supposed to do, how they're supposed to apply. So, um, and, uh, but most importantly, I became a better citizen. I fell in love with tax law because as Scott said, the Income Tax Act redistributes social income to such a degree, it is really the enabler of what Canadian society is all about. And so I, as a new immigrant, writing about tax law, that means so much to the Canadian society. And I learned this through writing the book, because before that I was mostly preoccupied with technical rules, um, tax planning and, and case law. But through writing the book, I think I became much better uh, in terms of understanding what the income tax system is. So that's as far as my career goes, if I could use another minute, just um, I, th I think today people get the freedom to share their personal stories and connections with Peter. So I will not miss the opportunity of sharing a, a, a one of myself, my own. I, uh, when I joined Osgood, um, I just had a baby. I was heavily pregnant when I came through the job interview so um, as a mother and writing a book that was so important, I was also put on faculty recruitment committee and many other things uh, happening in life. So when my daughter was about, I think 14, 15 months old, I brought her to meet a friend and my friend's daughter was a month younger than mine. And that baby was re reciting the 26 alphabets. <laughs> my daughter couldn't even say anything. <laughs> So when Peter asked me, he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm miserable. I'm a failed mother. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter said, as far as I know, all babies can speak the alphabets when the time comes. And I said, well, so I felt much reassured. And, I, <laughs> and then um, Patrick uh, asked me to consider becoming interim dean when he became provost of York University. I consulted a few colleagues. The first colleague I went to see said, why you? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and and uh, I had never been associate dean of Osgood. So it was a huge ask uh, and it was huge duty, uh, responsibility on my part. Then I called Peter. Peter said, do not worry, you can do it. The faculty will be behind you. So I said yes to Patrick. And so Peter has mean, meant so much to me and I'm very happy that I'm part of today's event. Thank you. Those were uh, such beautiful and remarkable interventions. Thank you. I wonder if I can now ask Adam, Jinyan and Scott in turn, if they could say something quite briefly, two or three minutes, um, it's an impossible task, I know, about why these texts are so central to your fields of study. Adam, can we start with you? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, recognize what a couple, what a number of people have said already today about Patrick in, in his opening comments about the simplicity, the clarity, um, starting from general principles and the normative nature of, of Peter's writing. And that's also something that Bruce mentioned in the last session, talked about, and he alluded to it in this session, that in the first edition of Constitutional Law of Canada, it wasn't just about division of powers, federalism, and a little bit of civil liberties. It also included part one, general concepts, responsible government, parliament, the crown, etc. That was unusual at the time. Constitutional law in the 1970s, as you've heard about the story 
Peter Hogg was not the most popular subject, either amongst faculty or students. And that's because it had become very narrow, largely across the country. Um, it had been focused on division of powers cases, mostly Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, and a little bit of civil liberties. Peter, the, one of the aspects I think of the normative nature of his work was his role in defining what is the Constitution of Canada? What is worthy of study? And I think that his vision extended beyond just what the Supreme Court or the other courts were deciding. He had a vision, and I, I discussed this with him once, where did this come from, that uh, of a much more, what I would say, a classical vision of constitutional law drawn from the Commonwealth, what he studied in Australia and New Zealand, which included other institutions of government. And so th that, had lar that entire territory in Canada had largely been ceded to the political scientists. And you really, really saw this in the crisis, the prorogation crisis of 2008, when Lauren Sawson and Peter Russell, two political scientists, Lauren is also obviously a jurist, but a political scientist as well, edited a book on the prorogation crisis, Parliamentary Democracy in Crisis. There were very few legal contributors to that book, very, very few legal academics. I think I, I six law profs out of 17. The rest were mostly political scientists. Two people that were excluded from the contribution were the two people who had a key role in advising the protagonist. Peter advising the governor general and Patrick was advising uh, the prime minister's office at the time. It's not, I'd say it's not by accident that Patrick, a student of Peter's, was doing that. So Peter broadened out the, the nature of constitutional law. And he did that through the first edition. He did that later um, in his work. And after that, I'd say certainly now, in many, many schools across the country, many faculties of law, some, not all of those topics of, uh, that were in the first edition, what I call it, sort of classical of constitutional law, have a resurgence that are now seen as worthy of study. This also helps explain the challenge that I had in 2000 in getting an article on the governor general published in a law review. I think today, a, a young academic would have far less of a problem getting their article uh, on the governor general or on responsible government or on the law of parliament published. And a lot of that has to do with the normative nature of Peter's work. Okay. Um, so. Uh a few words to say how great the book is. Um, the, the importance of the text in the tax law field is an imp empirical question. I don't have data to back up my claims, yeah? But I do want to claim it is a very, very important text in the field of tax law. Uh, as a teaching tool, it is used in, in teaching in the JD program, in the Osgood LLM program. There are some students, uh, graduates of the LLM program. I was told by students that the book changed their views about tax law because it showed the framework, the principles, the importance, and they, they can connect tax law to other areas of the law. So in, I was also told by colleagues uh, and students in other law schools, even though the text is not a prescribed required reading, because it's such a wonderfully written book, students use it as a reference. So they, they will use the book uh, to study on their own. Um, it, I, in terms of scholarship, I, I think the book has been cited by some researchers in some uh, publications, but again, I don't have empirical data. Um, and um, in terms of uh, development of uh, jurisprudence in the areas of the law, the book has been cited by all level of the courts in Canada, not as often as the constitutional text, because there are not many cases 
that went up to the Supreme Court of Canada, that it got cite, cited in some cases, uh, more often in, in the tax court, of, uh, tax court of Canada. And there are some distinctive features of this book. Firstly, in the tax law field, it is small. That's a distinctive feature because all other tax law books are huge, yeah? And um, also it's, it's a great explainer. It is not describing the rules, it explains what, why, so what. Uh, so that's why students love it. It's a framework about uh, first principles. And I totally uh, can agree with Justice Martin's assessment this is a thing of beauty. Have you ever heard anyone describing a tax law book as a thing of beauty? So that makes this book very, very distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jinyan. Over to you, Scott. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably echo a little bit of what Jinyan just said. Uh, the book reflects uh, from its earliest editions uh, where the forward where Peter is speaking to the forward and, and, he, and he says that the income tax system is a rational system. Uh, he's seeing two things. First of all, it is a system. It, it, it is not a um, instruction manual to build a barbecue. It's a system. Uh, and, and it is rational. That is, it reflects fiscal choices that have been made in other circumstances. It's not for the tax system to guess their correctness or necessarily uh, uh, lobby for one particular outcome or another once those choices have been made within the constitutional framework that his other uh, compassion was about. Uh, and the why matters a great deal uh, to um, what the statute means in particular advice giving circumstances. That is, the best practitioners wonder about why a provisions in the statute, not merely what the text apparently says, particularly in circumstances where um, potentially problematic tax avoidance uh, is involved or tax avoidance that others may see as potentially uh, problematic. So in the text, not only in its approach to the law, and I would say read that text, one can read that text and have a sense of how to approach any legal discipline. It's not just tax. Tax happens to be the object of that 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 book, but but the the the, the legal thinking in it is general is more generally uh, applicable. And I think that particularly now when I, there is a tendency, particularly in the international area, but also domestically in relation to perceptions of untoward tax avoidance, there is a there is a movement essentially to kick the law to the side. And that rather than infer from the law what it means, is what Peter did, uh, to superimpose on it an impression that others have about what it should have said. Uh, which is a very dangerous, uh, a dangerous, a dangerous, dangerous thing, and I think that there's a lot to be seen from 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 Peter's work from the standpoint of imposing some sort of discipline on that. And 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 Jin Yan is is right. Um, before it, there were other books of sorts. There were arts cases, um, uh, our admission course materials in Ontario, which some of us who are old enough uh, still might have retained copies. Of uh, there were there were accounting books that were prepared by accountants, but there was nothing, there was nothing um, that explained why, in, in an accessible form. That you can pick up any chapter in that book, you can spend an hour reading it, and even if you don't care about the tax system, you will come away from it with an appreciation of not only what it entails in that immediate context, but why, and that's very important. Thank you. Um, so thanks to the three of you for saying what you think might be distinctive about these texts. Adam, I have one last question from you, sure. which is what did you particularly learn or pull from or love about this text? Well, we, we've talked a lot about the text over the day and there are a couple of stylistic or personal points that stick out for me. So I'll mention two. One, uh, one day when I was going to meet Peter for lunch, I was met him at his office at Blake's and he was working on constitutional law of Canada and I asked him what he was doing. And he told me that he was working on the index. And I, I found that unusual, right? It's, it's something that generally a text author you know, that somebody at the publisher or, or a freelancer does. And he proceeded to, to lecture me, not, not in, in a, you know, in a, in a nice way about the importance of 
an index. And having a good index is really important for a book. And, and that's something that uh, it took me a while to, I think, understand. But over the course of the years, when I saw other books that have crappy indexes, um, I came to appreciate that. And it inspired me in my own work. In 2014, I wrote a, a little book of sort of explaining the Canadian constitution, very much inspired by Peter in a lot of ways. But one of the things I had come to realize was there didn't exist an index to the Canadian constitution. And um, so I did an index. And it, as far as I know, it's the first index. And it was very much inspired by, by Peter. The other point that really, really struck me and didn't take me five years to, to, to understand the value of was there were a couple of places where Peter would say, people talked about this earlier today, I used to think this, but I, I changed my mind. There was one that really, one or two that really stood out to me. One, he said, I used to think this, but Jane Smith, class of whatever, meaning a first year, which was clearly a first year student in his constitutional law class, changed my mind about that. And to me, as a teacher, I, I've had those moments where you've been teaching something for 10 years and a student asks a question and you realize like you've completely changed your view about things. So to me, it represented this incredible sort of openness of clearly Canada's greatest constitutional law scholar, the openness to learning from anyone, from a first year law student that we can learn, especially from our students. Not only that, to, to recognize that, but to credit this student by name. And, you know, there's so many of former students here today. Peter's sort of mentorship, his openness, the, the co-authoring, which was not sort of standard in, in the field. And you see that in constitutional law of Canada and that really the, the personality uh, uh, of the man comes through in the text. Thank you, Adam. I know we have a lot of students who are watching online uh, who are currently in our 1L Osgood class. So a special hello to them and please keep raising your excellent questions. So uh, Wade's paper for this symposium is on the impact of the Constitutional Law of Canada treaties on the uh, jurisprudence at the Supreme Court of Canada. So he's going to run us through some of his empirical findings for about the next six to eight minutes. Thanks, Wade. Thanks very much, Emily. Uh, before I delve into that, I just would like to acknowledge uh, the, the helpful contribution of uh, my co-author, actually, on this paper, who is my uh, research assistant, Emily Valancourt, who's, who's here today. Uh, and uh, sitting in the back. So Emily's currently a, a third-year law student at Western Law and will be clerking at the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, starting later uh, this, this year. So Emily is going to be co-authoring uh, this, this paper with me. So my very first publication actually was an article uh, about Canadian federalism that Peter asked me to co-author with him uh, in 2005. And so when I was thinking about today and uh, writing the paper, I thought a really nice way, I think, to kind of acknowledge Peter's wonderful practice of giving a, a leg up to, to junior scholars and lawyers was um, to, uh, to ask Emily to co-author this paper with me and an added benefit, of course, is that I've been able to benefit for her, from her excellent assistance. Um, so in attempting to unpack the influence of the treatise on the Supreme Court of Canada, Emily and I did quantitative and qualitative studies of the citations of the treatise by the court. And what we found is that Peter who popularized, of course, as we've heard in the previous panel, the notion of constitutional dialogue was, uh, as a previous panelist acknowledged, engaged in a constitutional dialogue of his very own uh, with the Supreme Court of Canada through his scholarship, but particularly, I think, through the Constitutional Law of Canada Treatise. So for our quantitative study, we gathered a list of all of the citations of the treatise by the Supreme Court of Canada between 1977, the date of the publication of the treatise, up to August uh, 2021, which is the date that my first update 
um, was uh, released. I'd like to just pause here briefly to acknowledge the contribution of a really fantastic group of summer law students at Blake Castles and Graydon uh, as well, uh, who helped us gather uh, these, these statistics. So we divided our, the, the citations by citation by decision and citation by opinion, because what we found is that often the treatise was cited by more than one judge in different opinions in the same decision. So we found that the treatise was cited 203 different, uh, in 203 different decisions of the Supreme Court during this period. From 1977 to 1986, the first decade of the treatise, it was cited 20 times, uh, which is not bad for a new treatise, right? Particularly given that the living author rule um, was not long deceased, uh, right? Um, so, uh, between 1987 and 1996, the second decade, uh, we see a ballooning of citations, 56 citations in the second decade. 1997 to 2006, the third decade, 52 citations. 2007 to 2016, 55 citations. Uh, and then 2016 to August 2021, which is obviously a shorter period, uh, we have 20 citations. So this is really showing the impact of the treatise right up uh, until Peter's death. So drilling down into the numbers a bit, we found that within these 203 different decisions, it was cited in 456 different opinions uh, within decisions, often more than once uh, in the same opinion. So if we encountered just actual citations within different opinions, the numbers would balloon even more. Uh, so it was cited in 252 majority decisions, 96 concurring opinions, and 108 dissenting opinions. Taking citations by opinion rather than decision, the treatise was cited most often in division of powers cases. So in 241 opinions in division of powers cases, 131 times in charter cases, 52 times in what we're calling basic principles, uh, cases, so that's following the organization of the book, uh, and then least often uh, six times uh, in opinions dealing with Aboriginal and treaty rights. So taking citations by opinion rather than the decision that this, uh, the treatise was cited 442 times with approval and 32 times uh, with disapproval. So I agree with the comment that was made, I think it was Justice Martin that made this comment that we can only glean so much from a sort of quantitative study like this. And so we've coupled our quantitative study with a more qualitative study where we drill down uh, into these numbers a bit to try to understand the nature of the influence, the impact that the treatise had on the court. And what we have found is that the treatise was used in five different ways. Uh, the court. The first is to assist in determining how earlier cases were decided. The second, to present an authoritative statement of the law. The third, to respond to the arguments presented by the parties. The fourth, to buttress the court's interpretation of the law. And then finally, to support the court's development and modification of the law. Sometimes here, often, frankly, by agreeing with the treatise, but sometimes, importantly, by disagreeing um, with the treatise uh, as, as well. So I think what these citations revealed to us is that the level of engagement with the content, with the substance of the treatise, was anything but superficial. Uh, in fact, there was a very deep level of engagement with the treatise that goes beyond citing it for basic points of law and actually engages with its substance, not only to buttress the court's interpretation of the constitution in some cases, but also to support its development and modification of it. So this I think really does support our conclusion that the court has been engaged in this constitutional dialogue of sorts uh, with Peter through, uh, through the treatise. Well, thank you so much, Wade. I think um, as someone who uses the text so often, I think we're all very glad that it's in your uh, kind and thoughtful and uh, very smart and brilliant hands. So thank you, Wade. I wonder if we could take the last few minutes to have you, Bruce, wind up and start thinking about uh, some of the challenges that having a text as a legacy might pose. Um, what are the challenges going forward? How we might think about this? I think Wade 
started throwing up these questions when he started thinking about how the text might be revised going forward. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Emily. Um, yeah, it's a good thing you tipped me off about that one earlier too. Um, um, I wanna say two things about that. And, and the first is I'm really glad that that challenge lands in the hands of Professor Wade K. Wright. <laughs> um, it's one of the interesting features of that interview that I mentioned earlier that was conducted by the Osgood Society um, in the, as part of the Oral History Project, which was back in 1991. And it was conducted by Christine Cates, who's done tons of interviews of lawyers and judges and, and professors for the, the society. And one of the things she asked uh, Peter then was, well, they were talking about the incredible workload it was to keep up with um, up the updates of constitutional law of Canada. And, and she said, have you ever thought about bringing on a co-author? And Peter said, um, yes, uh, my wife, Fran, is constantly urging me um, to take on a co-author. And it's something that comes up again and again in the interview and also in many of Peter's acknowledgments in the early editions of um, Constitutional Law of Canada, what a central role Fran played uh, in supporting and encouraging Peter. And she played an important role, an edi important editorial role. Um, she's really the reason we're all here because if they hadn't have met in 1962 in, in, at Harvard, he wouldn't have probably wouldn't have come back from New Zealand or Australia. So I, you know, I think it's really important to take a moment to acknowledge Fran and her contribution to Peter's career. And she was also constantly giving him wise advice. And one was, you should take on a co-author. And Peter said, I know Fran's right, but, and here's what it, here's um, what he said after that. I think probably I eventually will bring on a co-author, but I've got to find the right person. I have to psychologically adapt to the idea that it wouldn't all be my ideas. And I will have to accommodate another person's ideas. I think of the book as something that has to be nurtured and looked after and developed, you know, almost like a child. And I think it is that sense of loyalty to the work that keeps driving me. And it's clear that Peter was, you know, more attached to the Constitutional Law of Canada than any of his other scholarly um, uh, offspring. And he really struggled with this question. And uh, I think. I think he would be delighted to know that, that his baby is now um, in the hands of, of Wade and that the heavy responsibility of nurturing the continuing vitality of constitutional law of Canada is in Wade's hands. Wade wrote a beautiful preface um, to the fifth edition in, his, in 2021 that talks about the challenges of respecting um, Peter's legacy and, and filling his shoes going forward. And those of us who engage regularly the book, with the book will have noticed that Wade has already made extensive um, revisions to some of the most challenging chapters, for example, the POG chapter in the wake of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act reference or the Quality Rights chapter in the wake of recent decisions relating to Section 15 of the Charter. And, and I, I just wanna say that I think Wade's revisions are masterfully executed and they involve uh, enhancements of the text. They clarify the work of a legendary clarifier. They, they restructure the book's account of the law to align it with the evolving jurisprudence. And at the same time, the revisions highlight enduring thematic consistencies and have a harmonious tone that seamlessly blends Wade's and Peter's voices. Wade's revisions, I think, are finding sweet spots with just the right combination of continuity and change that will assure the preeminence of constitutional law of Canada for the next generation of cons generations of constitutional scholars in Canada and abroad. And then Peter, I'm quite confident, would rest easy knowing his work is in such good hands. Just a, a last comment, and I think it's maybe one of the biggest challenges Wade faces going forward, is especially when you think about the structure of the book and its approach to Canadian federalism. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to decolonize the way we think about the structure of Canadian federalism and rethink our approaches to sovereignty, uh, in particular, to take into account the existence of a third order of constitutional government in Canada, namely Indigenous 
um, the in indigenous governments. And Peter was alert to this. He knew about it. I mean, in that sense, his book just reflects this, the nature of the, the jurisprudence. And he was involved in negotiating the negotiation of self-government treaties, for example. And he wrote, wrote very well uh, about the issues. But I think it's fair to say that con the, the textbook is seriously deficient in this regard in that um, it reflects a, a colonial framework of thinking about sovereignty and federalism in this country and um, how to go about doing that along with doing all the annual updates of 60 other chapters to restructure the 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 book so that it, it takes account of the constitutional significance of indigenous governments and their powers is going to be uh, a huge challenge going forward. So it's been pure pleasure uh, chairing this panel and uh, all of my co-panelists put in such thought and care into their papers. So we thank them once more before Patrick uh, closes off the conference. Thank you. Well, it's been a remarkable day as I've sat through these sessions, this session, but all of the other sessions, memories flooded back to me of incidents, things, generosity, similar to some of what we heard in this panel, but in the other panels, to capture, I think, well, the many dimensions, contributions, both professionally and personally, that Peter Hogg had and the many, many lives he touched, the legacy that he leaves. And I, I want to thank everyone here for their participation. I also want to thank in particular the co-chairs, Sonia Lawrence, Jamie Cameron. It's been a lot of fun working with you. Sonia, we were colleagues for many years, but we never actually did get to work together. And I have to say, it's been a real pleasure working with you. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and no, I'm not surprised, but, it, but it, it was a really great experience and I wanna thank you. But I also particularly wanna thank Jamie Cameron because Jamie, you have been the driving force behind us today from the day that Peter passed in February of 2020. And you were the first and you have been the driving force to say we have to acknowledge Peter and remember Peter. And now what we have to do is do one more thing because we today have participated in this and it's people online. But what we must now do is secure the publication of papers from today. Some of our authors, some of our participants will not write papers, but others will. And we must gather those so that there can be a permanent record and a, a permanent account of Peter's unique contribution. So thank you, uh, everyone. We now do have a reception, and I do want to thank Blake's, who have been generous in sponsoring many aspects of today, and they are sponsoring this uh, reception. Please do uh, partake and have a chance to share some final reflections. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming, and have a good day. Thank you.